All right. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, depends where you're at. But uh, this is uh, Mark Moss. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, for you guys that uh, haven't done one of these yet, and just a quick little overview of what we're trying to do here. But during this time that we have uh, some free time, um, we wanted to go ahead and try to, you know, keep keep our training schedule up, you know, current. So we decided to go ahead and do some one hour courses um, to, you know, make use of some of this time that we have here. Um, so far, we've had four different subjects that we've done. We plan on doing three more this week. Um, just real quick to go over those. We're going to have uh, the love fires or the automatic filtering fires. We're going to have two sections on those an hour today and then a, a different hour tomorrow. And we're also going to do the uh, new touchscreen UHCs this week as well. And then we're going to go back over some of the ones that we've uh, previously done. So that's what the schedule looks like this uh, week. If anybody needs that schedule, if you want, there's my email address right here. Um, you can go ahead and email me and I'll go ahead and get that out to you. But I think it's already pre gone to the field. Um, just another thing too about the email. Um, like I said, for you guys that have been through some of these classes, you, you know that, you know, during the class, we're not able to take questions just for the fact that, you know, I mean, th these are scheduled for right at an hour and I go right up to the end. I'm not so sure about this one. This one's new. I don't know if I have as much on this one, but it, at the end, I can stick around a little bit after the hour. Somebody has some questions. Hang on there. I go ahead and stay on until um, everybody else is logged off because I, you know, I have some time. And um, so you can go ahead and ask me questions then, or if you got questions, just go ahead and email them to me. Also in this, there's a chat section and um, Roger Coley's in the room and he monitors that. So if something comes up, I mean, if we have an audible problem or you're not seeing the slides or whatever, go ahead and just put that in the chat and then he sees that. But other than that, these have gone real well. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with that. Um, some of you guys may have been some of the, you know, some of my training before. And, you know, I always tell people the stuff that we cover in these courses, we try to get 75% of all the service calls that we know of. Okay. You know, we, we go out, we work on the same stuff over and over. We have the same issues. It doesn't matter what kind of mechanic or technician you are. There starts to be trends and stuff. And that's what we cover. This by no means is going to go over everything that, that we have seen over the years. You're going to have those one-off things where, you know, it happens once in a lifetime type thing, but these right here are the ones that we see most of. I get the information for the training from our tech support because they're the ones that are um, they're the ones that are getting calls, you know, from technicians and users or whatever. And that's what we use to uh, put our training together. All right. Um, first, we got to take care of some legal stuff here. Again, if you've taken a class of mine before, if you do not work for an authorized service company, OK, or FAS, um, you have to go ahead and know that this course here does not um, make you a Frymaster representative. So you can't go and say, hey, look, I do Frymaster work now. I took an hour course and uh, now I'm authorized to do work for them. It doesn't work that way. We uh, there's a lot of legal factors that they go in. There's a pretty big process in becoming one of our authorized service companies. All right, this right here is information on how to work on equipment, but it does um, it doesn't ensure you to work on our equipment. It doesn't give you any licenses that may be required to work in our equipment. OK, it's just information on, on how to do certain things on the equipment and mainly on these right here. The next couple of days is how they work, which is very important. Fixing something is know how something is supposed to work. But anyway, this statement here, I just need everybody to, to read it and be aware of it. But this is just saying that this course here does not authorize you as a Frymaster service technician. OK, all right. With that, we're going to go ahead and get started. The fires that we're going to talk about now are the the love fryer and the filter quick. OK, and we're going to go through a little bit of background on these because it's very important to understand this to know how they work. Otherwise, trying to fix something and you don't even know how it's supposed to work in the first place, it, it becomes a real problem. These fires here were designed back in the mid 2000s, OK, and they were designed to answer a uh, an issue that was going on at the time, and that was because the cost of oil just skyrocketed. All right. In the mid 2000s to late 2000s, we had some issues with, uh, you know, with the economy and a lot of things went um, got very expensive and oil was one of them. Not only that, they, they switched the oils from a uh, the 
type that they used to have to a non or a zero trans fat oil, which also increased the cost. So when you have a product like oil that that a lot of our customers use because that's what's put in the fryers to cook with, whenever you have a product like that and the price is, is doubling in cost, that gets a lot of people's attention. All right. So something had to be done to be able to save this oil. You know, up until that point, everything that we did was based on how to make these fryers heat more efficiently. All right. But whenever the, the issue with the oil hit, everything then was about what can we do to save oil? All right. So some of the discussions that were had was, is what can we do to minimize how much exposure that we have our oil to the things that break it down? Number one thing that breaks oil down is heat. OK, unfortunately, when you're using this oil to cook with, you got to heat it up. All right. The standard cooking temperature, the most common um, cooking temperature for oil is 350 degrees. As you know, we have a big customer that cooks their protein products at 360. Well, during this time, they dropped that temperature back to 345 to eliminate the exposure the oil had to the heat. And that for anybody that was wondering why they made that change, it wasn't because of the uh, the quality of the, you know, that temperature, you know, on the food, it was just trying to save that oil. It became a big, big issue. All right. So there wasn't much that we could do about the temperature. We had to have the oil up to cooking temperature. So then we're looking at other things. It's like, you know, light, you know, affects the oil and, and the life of the oil, um, the moisture that comes from the ice crystals and stuff and the product that we cook. All of this stuff, there was nothing that we could do about it. I mean, we already have covers for the fryers and you know, whether they're being used or not, but that there wasn't any more we could do than that. So then the discussion turned is how do we not, you know, expose the oil to those conditions, but how much oil we expose to it. So that's why we went from a 50 pound fry pot to a 30 pound fry pot. All right. Just basic um, knowledge on our fryers here. Okay. Our fryers have three sections in them. We have a cold zone on the 50 pound fryers. We have a heat transfer area and we have our cooking area. All right. So when the discussion came up, it's like, well, OK, let's let's minimize how much oil we're going to expose to 350 degrees. All right. We had to start looking at where we're going to take that oil from. OK, we have the cooking area. Can't change that. We still have to have room for two baskets of product in here. We have our heat transfer area, which we have to have a certain amount of buffer in order to get the heat from the burners into the oil. Then we have our cold zone, OK? The cold zone is what made Frymaster. Um, that was the one of the original patents that Frymaster got when they became a company, is this cold zone here was to have debris that would fall off the product, um, fall down into this area. One, it's going to get it out of the cooking area, OK? And two, it's going to drop it down into an area that was much cooler than this cooking area, so it would stop the, the cooking process. If you was to take just a standard way that people used to fry before, you put a skillet on the stove, you had the heat transfer through the bottom of the, the pan, okay? And then all that debris that would fall down to the bottom there, it would continue to cook, all right? Anybody that's worked with one of these new fryers and gone out and has one where they don't filter and they allow all that debris to fall down into this area, okay, which, it's not a cold zone any longer, but we still have an area that's down here and we need that area. So we have somewhere for the burners to be. OK, so this area down here now is a lot smaller. OK, which is, again, not a cold zone. The high limit we place right about here. OK, and I'll show you a picture of that here in a little bit. If this was a cold zone, we certainly wouldn't have the high limit down there. So all that debris that falls down there is going to continue to cook. Now on the new fry pots, the 30 pound fry pots, the temperature from the cooking area, the heat transfer area, and this area down here, it differs very, very little. The only reason this area still exists is not because we're using this as a cold zone any longer. We just need this area for somewhere to put the burners. OK, so we cannot leave the customers under the impression that it's okay to store debris down here and it's down there like the old style fryers were. It's not the same. This is no longer a cold zone. Even though it looks similar, the only um, the reason why we have this is just the design of where we have our burners hanging. Okay. So anyway, <clears throat> that was what they did is they took this cold zone on the 50 pound fryer and basically eliminated it. That meant that we have 20 pounds less shortening 
in the fryers at any one time. All right, now that we don't have this cold zone, this area down here that we used as a garbage can, we no longer have that safe area for the debris to stay there. What we're going to have to do to compensate for that is we have to take this trash out more often. OK, so basically we took a big garbage can and we made it very small. OK, so whenever you have a big can and we know that every day we filled this can up and we would take it out once a day, that was basically how everybody operated. You just filtered once a day. Some stores that were higher volume may be filtered twice. But anyway, what it was is that we were taking out the garbage once a day. Now that we eliminated that garbage can or made it very small, OK, now we're just going to have to take out the garbage more often. That's the whole concept behind a love fryer. OK, instead of leaving that debris in here to be to have it exposed to the oil all day long, we're going to get rid of it and put it in an area where it's not going to do any harm. In this case, it's going to be down in the filter pan. OK, so now that we're filtering more often, OK, does that mean now that we're going to have to use more filter medium? Um, whether it be filter paper or the filter pads. No, if we used one a day before, all we're going to need to do is use one a day now. All right, we're not making any more debris, which clogs up that filter paper or pad, which is the only reason why you would ever have to change it. We're not making any more debris. We're just taking it out more often. OK, so, you know, when we're in classes and stuff, I mean, I always have, a you know, an example like, you know, point at the garbage can and say, look, we got a big 55 gallon drum sitting over there. If we now take that, or say a 50 gallon drum, if we now make that a five gallon can, okay, that just means if we filled that 50 gallon can up one time in the past, okay, or in that day after lunch and the drinks and stuff that we would have, if we filled that up and had to take it out once a day before, okay, now we made a five gallon can, now we're going to have to take it out 10 times, okay, or whatever the case is. All of those numbers were developed by the chains to buy these fryers. So whenever they test these equip or the equipment out, they say, OK, for our product, for an example, let's use McDonald's because they've had these the longest. All right. McDonald's, they decided whenever they cook 12 batches of fries, OK, in order to maintain the quality, you know, in the food. OK, and in order to um, save the, as much oil as possible, they decided after every 12 batches of French fries, all right, that they're going to go ahead and call for a filter. All right, and then basically what they're going to do is we don't scrub the vat during those filter cycles. We, you know, we don't have to put the gloves on and the apron and the face shield. All we're doing is taking out this trash that gathers down here at the bottom of this tank. All right, that's all we're doing. We're not filtering. We're not scrubbing the pot or anything like that. Basically, what we're doing is just flushing out the trash. We're just taking out the trash. Whereas before on this one, when we filtered once a day, all right, then, yeah, we would go in there and we would scrub the pots and then, you know, do a little bit more. We'd polish the oil. We do that with these, but that's only done once a day. That's the end of day, day filter, or it's also referred to as the maintenance filter. We still do that once a day, but the filters, whenever you're cooking and it says filter now, yes or no, all right, whenever we do that, we're basically just flushing out, taking out the garbage, okay? It's not the whole big, long, drawn-out process. It is very important to make sure that your customers know the difference. All right. They, you know, before these came out, when you mentioned about filtering, usually there was a person that come in just to do the filter. In some states, you had to be a certain age even to do that because of the fact you're draining 50 pounds of 350 degree oil because you have to filter at cooking temp or, you know, at least about 300 degrees. All right, so now people get in their mind. It's like, oh, okay, I got to go get the apron and the gloves and the face shield and all of that stuff to get ready to do an hour-long process of filtering these fryers. But no, now that process, okay, and again, I've always said we probably shouldn't have called that filtering, but now that process is just going to take four minutes, okay? When these fryers were designed, in order to make this whole thing work, the time to, it, when you press that button, when it says filter yes and you hit yes, the time that it takes to flush out that fryer and come back up to cooking temperature is four minutes. I think the actual time, there's a poster here that is four minutes and two seconds, all right, is what they averaged it out. All right, but it was four minutes in order for that whole process to be done, okay? I always tell people, okay, when it says filter now, you're going to have to push a button, okay? Whether it's yes or it's no, you've got to push a button. 
your workload is going to be the same either way. All right. So we need to make sure that they know and understand what I just told you and why it's so important to go ahead and filter these fryers. If this fryer, OK, if they choose to hit filter, no, I was just in a customer store two weeks ago. All right. I went into uh, no, actually, it was last week, but um, last week for a test fryer. While I was there, they hit it said filter yes or no. They hit the filter three or no three times while I was there. OK, and it, it was a, during the slow time. I mean, he would hit the button and then just go back leaning against the counter behind him. All right. It is very important that they know when it says filter yes or no, that they choose the right button, which is yes. If that debris is allowed to stay down here, it's going to continue to cook. If people come in in the morning, OK, and they could have brand new oil. All right. And I've seen it many times. There's one um, store in New York that I had to fly up to because of issues and it was all because they didn't filter. All right. They changed the oil twice a day. All right. This was an extremely high volume store. All right. And it was one of the chains that we deal with, but it was a high volume store. They were changing the oil twice a day. OK, when I got there, this thing was completely filled up and you guys have probably seen this before where the debris was so high that the baskets were sitting on the debris. The burners are right here. Our heat transfer area is right here. OK, that's where most of the heat is transferred. That's why these baffles are here to slow that heat down. So, of course, it goes into the oil to heat the oil up. All right. If you got debris that's all the way up here, just imagine you have a pan sitting on the stove with cornmeal or whatever you got in it, and it's continued to heat all day long. Just imagine how black this debris is going to be in there and how dark that oil is going to be. That's exactly what was happening there. All right. And all because they didn't filter. All right. How did I know they didn't filter? Very simple. You can go into the computer and I'm going to show you the sheets for that. We went over that on the uh, filter section that we did two weeks ago. We will be doing that filter one again. So just look for the schedule to see when, when we're going to do that again. Anybody that may have people within their group that hasn't seen some of these or somebody on here hasn't seen a particular one, let us know if we have enough people to, to repeat one of these. By all means, the material is already made, so I can go ahead and repeat these as, as we need to. All right. But again, I know that we've only gone over like two slides here, but this is so important. I know people always say, well, I want to learn how to change the filter pump and motor. I want to learn how to, you know, you know, whatever it is. We won't have to do that if we get people using these prompt or correctly. OK. So, yeah, we're not actually, you know, talking about how we remove and replace parts right now, but knowing how these things work and being able to get this information to the people when you're out there doing the startups and, and things like that is very important. OK, we have, you know, I have heard people say that, you know, having this trough down here and again, I'm not going to call this a cold zone because it is not a cold zone. All right. This is a cold zone. Look at the size of this versus this. OK, the burners slide in right here and even that's the case over here, too. But again, with that blower motor that we have on these, the air is forced up here. So this is where the concentration of heat is. OK, just because we have to have the ver uh, the uh, burner sit in there vertically. All right. Is why we have this area right here. Again, please get out of the habit of calling this a cold zone because it is not a cold zone. This we need to make sure we keep clean. If there's debris in there, it's going to continue to cook and it's going to break down that shortening. All right. Um, with that, let's go ahead and move on and we'll backtrack to this a little bit. Um, but anyway, let's just go ahead and move on from now. This right here, just again, just showing you the difference in the size of these things. Look how wide this is. It used to be you could get your hand down there to wipe this out. Not in this one. All right. Like I said, we have to have this area here. OK, in order to have a you know a place for the burners, because these burners, you know, we've learned with other products, they, they work a lot better vertically than they do horizontally. All right. Let me get back to the point that or when I said before, this right here is the return. There is a valve on the other side of this, which I'll show you here a little bit later. But this is the oil return. So all that debris comes down here. We have this style and we have electric fryers, love fryers and filter quick, which I'll tell you the difference here in a second. But all of that debris comes down here. All right. McDonald's, for example, you know, after every 12 batches of French fries, 
it's going to say filter now. If they are using this equipment properly, they're going to go ahead and filter. How much debris is going to be down here after 12 batches of fries? Not a whole lot. On the protein products, chicken nuggets, um, the chicken patties, or whatever. On those, after every six cooks, it's going to ask you to filter now. How much debris is going to be down here after six cooks? Okay, not a lot. All that debris is going to be concentrated in this area down here where it's all in one spot so we can just go ahead and flush this stuff out. We have four minutes to do that until we get back up to cooking temperature. This here, if used properly, is the best design. All right, we have electric fires which basically have a flat bottom, and I'm going to show you a picture of that before the end of the day here. And we have now tube fires. Some of the customers that we have that uses tube fryers because of, you know, chicken is usually tube fryers are the uh, the uh, fryers that people use for um, frying chicken. So people that um, use our tube fryers, they also wanted this oil saving feature. So we make those. So basically it has a flat bottom. OK, mm -hmm. some of our competitors have fryers that have tubes in it that has a flat bottom. Those fryers, all that debris is spread out, uh, you know, across a lot bigger area. OK, so one for us, we have to use bigger pumps just to try to get as much debris out as what this one does here with a pump half the volume. OK, this here uses a gas fryer uses a four gallon per minute pump, whereas an electric love fryer or filter quick uses an eight gallon per minute pump. The reason for that is, is because there's such a big area where all that debris is spread out. This here collects it all at one nice spot. The only problem with this is if it's not filtered, you run into problems because now that debris, that pressure is going to build up to where it's going to go back. It could clog this up. All this stuff is going to be down here in the area where it's going to be heated in here, and it's going to cause that oil to, to get bad in a hurry. And all that uh, debris in there, I mean, it turns jet black. I mean, the oil is like crude oil. All right, it's just completely black. All right, just to backtrack a little bit on that store that I was talking about in New York that changed their oil twice a day. Once we got them on track, and just so you know, and I told you you could go in and get the filter stats and stuff out of the computer. This is one that I pulled the stats, and the day before it stopped working, because you can only pull um, the last seven days, but the day before it stopped working, they bypassed the filter 47 times. That's why the filter wasn't working anymore. Okay, It got to a point that there was so much debris built up that even if you know they did decide to filter, they, it couldn't push all of that debris out of there. OK, and I'll, I'll show you some of the places where it's more likely to clog up if they're not being used properly. If you filter this every time it tells you to, you're never going to have issues with this clogging up because that little bit of debris is right there and it flushes it right out. So anyway, that oil that would have definitely been thrown away. OK, when I got there, because that stuff was just completely burnt. Well, the oil wasn't burnt, but it, all the debris that was in it. I filtered that once we got this running, filtered that oil. And I was there for three more days. Actually, it was four four days, but right before I went to the airport, I stopped and they were still using that same oil. How long it lasted after that, I don't know. I can't imagine um, a store like that being able to get the life that some stores do. There's some stores out there that actually do not ever change their oil because the fact that it has the top off and the fact that they're filtering as much as they're supposed to, the top off, it actually just you know, I guess it's like perpetual motion where it actually just they don't have to actually ever discard the oil because as it goes away, new oil comes in and that's the way it works. OK, because we have the top off system in here. Those are rare. I haven't personally seen when I've been told that there are some stores out there to do that. But I know um, as far as people using their oil for two weeks, I mean, that's fairly common. There is so many testimonials about how much money that is saved and it's not just from Frymaster, it's from our customers, it's from our competitors. This is a proven concept. That is why now some major chains, McDonald's included, if you buy a fryer, it has to be a love style fryer with a 30 pound fry pot. You can't even get this anymore. It is no longer available for McDonald's, at least domestically. You have to use this style here. So whenever we got information like that, you know, that we have chains. I mean, and it's not just with one chain. Most chains on corporate stores, they will not buy these because they save so much money in shortening using this. Whenever you have companies that do that, trust me, it works. So when you go into a store and they say, oh, no, we're too busy for this to work, I can tell you, 
you know, either have them talk to their corporate office or refer them back to us. Because I can assure you, I have been in some extremely busy situations, whether it's at conventions, where they're doing competitions or whatever, they never miss a filter, all right? So the concept does work. We can never show signs of weakness whenever we're discussing these or doing a, um, a uh, startup or, or, you know, the, uh, yeah, the startup in training. We can never say, well, maybe you are too busy. No, the answer is no, you're not too busy. All right, these have been tested in the busiest of situations. And even though, you know, people that are working in stores, I mean, I've worked in restaurants before in my younger years, but, you know, even when you think you're busy, there's people out there that are busier. This concept had, was proven, okay, to work in those conditions. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it right now, 11 years later, okay? On the, um, the Love Friars, okay, which is the ones we sell at McDonald's, all right? This is the Love Friars, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. These are the Filter Quick. These fires came out in 2009, all right? We had some test ones out before that, but the actual ones that got released that, that stayed in the field and didn't get pulled back was in 2009. It wasn't until five years later that there were some issues corrected and some patents that we had to get around and some trademark stuff that we had to get around before we released the filter quick which is the general market one that we sell to everybody other than McDonald's. The main difference in these two fryers is the controllers. Okay, there are some other differences too that the technicians may know, but for the most part, it's just the controllers. With that being said, I wanna mention it now and I'll mention it later. You cannot use the software from a love fryer in a filter quick. We cannot use controllers from a love fryer on a filter quick or vice versa. OK, anything that's in the CAN network, which I'm going to show you here in just a second, anything that is in that network cannot be interchanged. Now, as far as the heating portions of these fryers, they're exactly the same. They're exactly the same as the fryers that we had before we had the automatic filtering on them. OK, but when it comes to the CAN network, the parts that communicate with each other to know which with uh, each fryer is doing, those are not interchangeable between the two platforms here. All right. You have to use love components on a love fryer and you have to use filter quick on a filter quick. If you have software for a love fryer and you for whatever reason try to install it on a filter quick, all right, go ahead and order you two new computers, an MIB board, two AIF boards, which are underneath here, and I'll show you that here a little bit later. And there's an ATO box back here. Go ahead and order each one of those parts because you're going to need them. Once you try to install um, the, the opposite software in a fryer, it, it wipes out all the boards and there is no coming back. You cannot recover. You can't, you know, take the software away and put it, it's gone. Okay, and that's happened just a couple of times, but believe me, it gets people's attention. When we go out to do a software upgrade, fryer's working fine, but we want to do a software upgrade, and you leave and that fryer is completely down with thousands of dollars of parts on order, which the customer obviously doesn't um, get that, but you know, yeah, that's not a good day. That is not a good day. That's a technician nightmare. So, but anyway, just keep that in mind that we have to use the right software. This right here, very important to know, three levels, cooking level, heat transfer area, the old days cold zone, okay? Now we do not have a cold zone. That idea was a great idea during the time that it came out, but now that we have fryers that have filtering in them, there is no reason to store debris in here any longer. That's where this idea came up or came from. That's the whole concept on a love fryer. We just got rid of the garbage can and now we take out the garbage more often. That's what saves the oil. And then the fact that we have a top off so that oil can be stored in an area that's not at 350 degrees. It's in a um, light proof or opaque container so the light doesn't get to it. So that's the whole concept of a love fryer. But it's very important. We don't have room for error here all right, because that this area is so small, it is not designed to store debris. This should never have debris that would ever get higher than this if it's being used properly. All right, a couple of acronyms, love, I've mentioned that a bunch of times. That is owned by McDonald's, that's low oil volume. That just means we have less oil in the pot. In order to make all of this happen and to be able to press a button, filter and have it come back up to set temp in four minutes, we need to have um, some systems within this fryer. One of them is the ATO. We are gonna cover the ATO system tomorrow, 
Okay, the ATO system, I've always said, is very misdiagnosed. All right, most of the time it's a very simple problem. Okay, but we're going to cover that tomorrow. We're going to break some of these systems down and cover those tomorrow. The AIF is the automatic intermittent filtration system. Basically, that's the components that keep track of how many times you cook. Okay, and then tells you to filter and the components that are required. Okay, to make that happen to where you know the actuators that, that open a drain valve and then the actuators that open a return valve, the the relay, the the MIB board that turns the uh, that sends the voltage to the relay to turn the pump and motor on. Okay, all of that is the AIF system. Okay, the automatic intermittent filtration. The CAN is the controller area network. Okay, now these fryers, unlike before, every fryer needs to know what the other fryer is doing. The controllers now. They're the ones that um, operate the filter system. So if you got one fire filtering, the other ones need to know, okay? Because that pan is only big enough to hold the oil of one pot. Trust me, there's a lot of people that it's tested that theory, but it only holds oil from one fryer, all right? So each one of these fryers needs to know what the other one's doing. So communication on these fryers is very important, okay? And we're going to talk about that in the next slide here. The jib is just the jug in the box. That's part of the ATO system. That's just the jug that we pull from whenever we filter and a little bit of oil goes away or just during cooking, you know, some of the oil goes with the product. This is what's going to replenish that oil. OK, it's just a system. Again, we'll cover that a lot more tomorrow. The MIB is the manual interface board. OK, that's actually the heart of the whole filtering system. All right, we will talk about operating that board tomorrow. It is very important that if you work on love fires or filter quick fires that you know how to use the MIB board. All right, anytime that you're unclogging the system, um, changing a pump and motor, you just want to test parts. In the old days, you just open and close the valve, made it easy. Now, without this board, you would actually have to go into the computer and go into those systems to do that. We don't want to do that. Anybody that works on these fires that doesn't know how to use this, believe me, after tomorrow, if you sit through this course, I'm, I'm going to make your life a lot easier, okay? I don't know how anybody works on these fires and does not know how to use the MIB board. So if you don't, please try to attend one of the classes tomorrow. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and cover that. All right, this right here is the CAN network. We have our 3,000 computers, whether it's the M3000, which is the McDonald's, or just the 3,000 computers we use on the filter quick. We have the 3,000 computers, the MIB board, the AIF boards, and the ATO board. I'm just going to mention this real quick now. The Lawn Works board was McDonald's attempt to go ahead and have a system where they can monitor the fryers remotely. OK, for anybody that doesn't know, there's a lot of people in the race in, in order to get a system that does that. We have fryers right now that we can access information. Anything that's stored in that fryer, we can get. And it's not just the fryers. Back then when this Lawn Works system, you know, it was the grills, it was the UHC cabinets that we make that uh, Roger's going to do a course on later this week on the new ones. Um, and the freezers, there was other stuff. Basically, you can go ahead and, oh, it's great. If we get a call on a store that has this and we can go in, it's like, ah, oh, they bypass filter this many times. The filter's not working. You got a pretty good idea of what's happening. This was their attempt. In 2014, they decided, okay, we're not going to go ahead and move forward with this. Um, I don't know. I heard that it needed some updating because you know how technology is. You know, it gets obsolete very quick. Either way, they decided to go ahead and stop using this. OK, so now we stopped putting them on the new fryers because every fryer that left here had one of these boards until it was late 2014. If you have an issue, OK, where you have intermittent problems, whatever it is in this network, go ahead and disconnect this. There's some. Um, power supplies and things like that that are used to power up this system. OK, when we get rid of those, sometimes, you know, there's noise and stuff created by that. If we get rid of that, sometimes that fixes our problem. OK, it's a little bit grasping at straws, but nonetheless, it's not needed anymore. So let's just get rid of it. There is an end of line resistor, OK, at the beginning at the and the end of these fryers. OK, that resistor there is to absorb noise and stuff from the wireless headsets and and other things, microwaves, whatever. All right. But we need to go ahead and take that off of here and put it there. There is an instruction sheet online on how to remove this board. And man, it's been a while since I've done one. 
because that's been six years ago. But I don't think that there's any parts required. I think there's some splices, but, you know, you can use whatever splice you want. But uh, other than that, I think it's just a matter of having the instructions and then putting that resistor on the ATO board. OK, but we can go ahead and get rid of this here. All right. Enough about that. Um, in the line resistor. OK, with the fact that we have a resistor here, if we think we got an issue, OK, with our network here, the CAN, all right, we can go ahead and just disconnect a, you know, uh, say on the AIF, you know, we can disconnect one of the plugs and we can ohm out either on the harness side or the board side and we should get 120 ohms. All right, so when these first come out, I remember hearing that and people were saying it's a good way to, to troubleshoot. The only problem is, is, well, there's actually more than one problem. One, AIF boards are hard to get to, okay? They're underneath the fryer. Okay, I'm a not a little guy, you know, and plus I'm getting a little bit older and I don't move that well. But the thing of it is, is, you know, to get to those, okay, it wasn't very practical, okay? In theory, you should get 120 ohms if you was to ohm this out, okay? And if it started going up in resistance, that means we got a bad connection. Bad connections aren't good when we have a system that communicates like this, all right? Since it was very hard to, to access those, there's another thing that you can do OK, which we call pinging the system. OK, and I have a blow up of these controllers, which let me go to that because this is important. If the fryer is off and it will say off, it's not going to just be blank. This one here is just not plugged in. If the fryer is off, if you press the temperature button, OK. Or the temperature button here on these fryers, what it will do is it is going to show you the 3000 and it's going to give you the software version. OK, so if it's this one, we will check this controller. Oops, sorry. We will check this controller, the MIB board, this AIF and the ATO. If the lawn was there, you would see that, too. But, you know, um, most likely it's not going to be. But anyway, we're going to see those components. The reason why this controller knows to communicate with this AIF is because there is a locator. And I'm going to show you this. There is a locator plug on the back here. It's a six pin plug because we can have up to six fryers in a bank. The MIB board will actually operate six fryers. OK, the AIF board, you have one controller, one AIF for each fry pot. OK, the ATO, the ATO can handle three fryers. If we have a fourth fryer, the first three fryers will be on one ATO and then the fourth, fifth, and up to six, I've never seen a six bank fryer, but up to six will be operated off the second ATO. All right, and then of course, again, like I said, the lawn's there, but we're not gonna worry about that. All right, so this one here will have a six pin plug on it, and this will have a plug. Whatever pin number is grounded, so if pin number three is grounded, this makes this the number three um, controller. So it's only going to communicate with the number three AIF board. If we was to take this computer and this computer with the ground wire with it, okay, and we was to swap it, if this is the number one computer, it's going to operate the number one fryer. All right. And we've done that before, just messing around and stuff. The only time I've ever seen that happen in the field is when somebody was changing a fry pot and they disconnected everything. And when they put it back, they just got the controllers mixed up. But yes, this is only going to look for the controller that has the number one pin or the AIF board that has the number one pin grounded. OK, and then this one here is the same way. Now I'll show you that here in a second. All right. So if you press that temperature button, you're going to see that everything is there. What you're looking for is you want to see first if you see the component and two to make sure the software or what the software version is and make sure the software versions are compatible. I cannot tell you the latest software. I, there's no way I can keep up with all that. But we have a group of guys that do in the call center, and they can always get you the latest software and tell you which ones are compatible. As a rule of thumb, anytime you change any one of these components, you have to do a master reset. I'll show you how to do that. It's a hidden um, switch that you have to hit. You have to do a master reset, okay? And there's also a reset on the MIB that I strongly suggest that you go ahead and clear that out too if you change something because obviously there was an error that would have led you to change a component okay and 
all the guys in tech support, and I do back them because I think it's a good idea, all right, they tell you that you need to update the software too. If any one of these components here is changed, okay, if you notice, there's no interface board on here. Interface board doesn't communicate in this manner. Just these components, okay, that communicate, if you change one of those out, at a minimum, you have to do a master reset, which is just kill power, just reboot it. But like I said, it is our policy to, to go ahead and do the software too. Now, if you have a component that has the same software, in theory, no, but it's good to go ahead and get everything reset up. And with the fact that we've had love fires out there for 11 years, there's no guarantee and there might have been a part sitting on the shelf for a while that had older software. It is a good rule of thumb to go ahead and update the software. This right here, tomorrow, we're going to be talking about the OIB. There is a signal that the computers need. It's a ground for the 5 volt DC signal that goes back to the computer. Those computers need to see that before they'll, they'll do anything, including call for heat. Without that signal, they don't call for heat. We use that as a safety, okay, because that oil back sensor will break that um, signal, okay, so that would mean the computers don't call for heat if the OIB is not um, satisfied. If you don't know how that works, tune in tomorrow and I'll make sure that we everybody's clear on that. All right, um, here, once we get to the MIB, the MIB board has a 24 volt transformer that is either located on electric fire behind the controller, I'll show you that, or in a transformer box in the on a gas fire. Here's where the 24 volts starts. That 24 volts, okay, is gonna power up the AIF boards. The ATO has its own 24 volt transformer. This has happened more than once. Somebody calls in and says, hey, my fryers are not heating. First thing you need to do is open up the door where the MIB board is. I'm gonna show you the location of every one of these parts, okay? But obviously by picture, but I'm gonna show you where they're located on the fryers. All right, on the MIB board, there's going to be a cutout on a, on a cover, okay? That cutout, you should have an LED display. Normally, it says A. If the pan is pulled out, it's going to say P. If that is blank, that means that there's no power. Somehow, the transformer has been taken out. Transformers in the back on a gas fryer on a, uh, yeah, the transform in a transformer box, all right? Through the time we've had that transformer box back there ever since the 80s when we started making h50 fryers sometimes those transformer boxes get hosed down and it takes out the transformer this transformer included if that mib transformer is gone not supplying voltage here none of these boards are going to have voltage so if we ping the system and we don't see the aif board on this one the next thing you want to do is check this one if all of the aif boards are gone most likely we got an issue with power, okay? Like I said, first thing I always do is open the door. Do we got anything on the MIB? We're going to talk a lot more about troubleshooting using the MIB board where we don't have any tools. There was a technician or, you know, one of the uh, other trainers here when I first got back, he said, yeah, we're going to troubleshoot these and never use a meter. Coming from the military, that was just unheard of. You know, it's like, whoa, whoa, you can, but the thing of it is, is we have a lot of built in and we're learning more and more all the time. Okay. And it'll happen. That's the good news. Okay. We're getting a lot better at these. I guess the bad news is we don't make love fires anymore. The traditional love fires that have that M3000 controller on it like this, we don't make these anymore. Not domestically. I don't know if we do overseas or not. Everything now is touchscreen. Okay, but we still have 11 years of these fires out. Well, actually 10 years of these fires out there. There is a lot of them, so we still have to know how they work. Plus the uh, heating portion and the uh, the theory of these. I mean, it's the same whether it's a touchscreen or if it's this kind of controller. All right. Anyway, we could use this more and more to troubleshoot. We're going to hit on this a little bit more tomorrow on, on part two of this. But that's the basics there. Pinging that system. The guys on the phones, I mean, before they'll even discuss anything with you, they're going to ask you, did you do that? If this, thing, if we don't at least start off knowing that this thing is communicating, okay, then we're just, you know, taking a shot in the dark. Okay, we need to know that all of this stuff is linked in and at least we're dealing with the correct software and everything. Okay, all right. Um, like I said, there's more that we could cover on here. Um, again, when you're pinging, always ping all of them. OK, or check the softwares on all of, them. you know, because if you're getting a common thing like with the AIF, you know, most likely that's going to be power. 
Okay, communication can go through there without power. Okay, or the yeah the uh, communication signal. But anyway, things like that, knowing which ones come on. If you just got an issue with one, okay, most likely it's going to be on that board. It's probably not going to be a connection. Otherwise, that's going to trickle down. OK, so things like that. It, I mean, pinging that system gives you so much information and knowing the software and that it's compatible. That's why whenever you call in and you're working on one of these fires, the first thing they're going to ask, just have that information handy. OK, the best way to do it is to hit that button on here. OK, hit the button. It's going to start scrolling. Just take your phone and film it. All right, then you can step back out of the way, put a guy on tech support on speaker and you can be looking at the video whenever. That's that's how I always do it. So you don't have to worry about trying to write it all down as it's scrolling through. Um, oh, one other thing here. If you press and hold the temperature button on this controller, it's also going to give you the temperatures for the HTO and AIF. Unlike the uh, Love Fryer, OK, this one here, if you press and hold it for three seconds, if you just press and release, it's going to give you the software versions. Actually, this one here is going to tell you it's a filter quick, whether it's gas, what time of day it is, what the date is and all of that stuff, then it's going to go through and it's going to give you the uh, 3000 software. It's going to give you the MIV software, the AIF software, and then the ATO. This one here takes a little bit longer because it goes through that other stuff. But if you press and hold this for three seconds, it's going to, and I don't remember which order, if it's ATO first or AIF, doesn't really matter, but it tells you the temperature of those probes. That's good information when you're troubleshooting that because then you can compare all the probes because they should all be the same temperature. But when we talk about that, uh, daisy chain or that can network this right here this is the controllers we all know where those are located okay they're just on the front of the fryer okay press and release the temperature button on this one that's pinging the system okay press and release you ping the system on this press and hold it's going to give you temperatures okay this right here what was this oh yeah this is the end of line resistor that's on the right hand fryer okay I think there's even a part number on there and stuff too. I, I don't remember. I used to carry one of these around, but I don't anymore. But anyway, and then this is that locator wire. It's just a six pin plug. Whichever pin is grounded, that is the one that um, that makes it that number computer. OK, and that's that locator wire. All that you just lower the computer down. And obviously I'm just showing you pictures of the back of the controller. OK. This right here is the MIB board. If you take that T25 Torx screw, whether it's one or three, I don't know if they changed it now to just one or if the filter quick just had one, but it doesn't matter. You're either going to have three or you're going to have one. I've seen both. All right. Once you take that cover off, this is what you're going to see. For the most part, well, what you're um, going to see a normal operation is either going to be the A or it's going to be a P, okay, if the filter pan is out. OK, there's a switch. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. There's a switch in the back of that pan that if it's made, it has an A. If it's open, then it's going to have a P saying that that pan's out. There's a safety in it. It's going to make it to where it won't filter or drain the oil if that pan's not in place. All right. One thing, and I'll go into this a lot deeper tomorrow, but all the safeties are over road when you're using the MIB board. OK, and we're going to talk about all these functions on that tomorrow. This right here is the AIF board, whether it's gas or electric, they're underneath the fry pots. They're hanging down. There's one screw that holds it on and there's a tab in the back. The actuators plug into here. You can swap actuators around to do troubleshooting. Um, we're going to talk about that tomorrow when we talk about the MIB board because there's a lot of troubleshooting we can do with that. This right here is the ATO board. It's in the ATO box, which is behind the jib. OK. If when you take that cover off on a fryer that was in a McDonald's prior to late 2014, that is the lawn works board. OK, we now can take that off. And like I said, there's instructions online. This right here, though, that box is located behind the jib. That's the ATO board. All right, the reset It's a little bit hard to see these. I had some better pictures, but I guess I forgot. Um, there is a black rocker switch. OK, that's underneath there. Whenever you press that it's spring loaded. So whenever you press and hold that switch, it cuts the power to the complete fryer. OK, we need to do that at a minimum if we change any of those can parts. OK, the three, the controller, the MIB, the AIF or the ATO, we have to do a complete reset. OK, again, plan on doing the, the uh, um, software too. on a gas fryer. You notice where the jib is. 
it's behind on the far left door. Okay, the switch is there. You may have to look un under there. Sometimes people are a little reluctant to stick their hand up there knowing that there's wires and stuff there. But the switches are right there and you can see it. It's just a black rocker switch. On an electric fryer, it's gonna be behind the far right um, door and it's right by where the jib reset switch. There's an orange button right there that if you got bulk, you press and hold it. And then it brings the oil in or if you change the jib out, you just press that to reset the uh, ATO system. We will be talking about the ATO system, the OIB and the MIB boards tomorrow. All right. But this is where the master reset switches are. Anytime you change one of those components, you have to do that. Just some general stuff here. Um, the ATO probes is right here. We're going to talk about that system tomorrow. These are the AIF probes. This is the OIB. This is the, uh, the temperature probe. So when you press and hold that button on the uh, 3000 controllers, like on a filter quick, it's going to give you the temperature of this probe and the temperature of this probe with the fryer on, just like any other controller that we had. If you press the temperature button, it's going to give you the temperature of here. Knowing whether or not all three of these probes are reading the same, that's pretty good information. These probes use the same resistance chart that we talked about on the um, the uh, probe sensing circuit that we did two weeks ago. And we're going to have that. We're going to do a encore presentation of that this week. I, I forget what day it is. It's on the schedule. Um, but we talked about the resistance and how this senses temperature. All right. If these are all in the same oil, they should all be at the same temperature. So having that button there to tell us the temperature, OK, is good information. We could do that with the love fry if we did a software change. But I can tell you with the fact that those fryers are now obsolete. OK, we ain't going back to do a software change to add any functions on them because it's just, you know, if the software is stable, it's best just to leave it alone. So but anyway, that's what it'll tell you. OK, then if you notice, look where the high limit is. If this was a cold zone, we would not have the high limit down there. OK, that would never uh, pass agency. This is no longer a cold zone. Oops. This right here is an electric fryer. Like I told you, it's pretty much a flat bottom fryer. So getting all that debris to get out of there, OK, is a little bit trickier than this one here because all that debris is right where we need it. This is the drain valve. We have that small half inch opening. It'll shoot all that debris straight out there as long as we're doing it as much as we're supposed to. OK, this here is the better design of all of them because it gets the most debris out. This here is just a little bit harder to wash all that down. That's why we have to have a pump to twice the size as the other one, because this is eight gallon per minute on electric versus four gallon per minute. All right, and of course, we have the ATO, the AIF and the uh, high limit temperature probe on electric fryer. OK, is on the element. What's going to happen if you don't filter when you're supposed to? You're going to be cleaning this elbow out. And I could bet you if I could see everybody out there now, there's probably some reactions of people that work on these because you have changed, cleaned this elbow out. I mean, it's almost a given. If you got to go out and you look in that pot and you see a bunch of debris, you get the filter stats and you realize they hadn't been filtering. You know what? There ain't much troubleshooting involved. We're going to go back here and we're going to clean this elbow out, possibly this one, more likely this one. It used to be any time that you had a clogged filter, it was guaranteed, OK, that they were not loading the filter pan properly. OK, that's not the case anymore. The debris now is not coming from the filter pan to get into the pump or clogging up line. It's coming from the fry pot back. And how this works is, you know, if you have debris in that pot, OK, this valve is what's going to open for the top off system. The only thing is, is the top off, which we'll learn tomorrow, the pump is 11 gallons per hour. OK, this is four gallons per minute. So there's a lot more um, pressure on this one, obviously, than there is for the top off. That top off is not going to clear this line out. OK, so that debris and if you got 30 pounds of short and this is at the very bottom and all that debris gets in here, that 350 degrees and the pressure of 30 pounds of shortening builds up quite a bit of pressure where it just packs this in there. It used to be that there was a Strito, a black iron Strito, OK, that was on here and you take those off. I mean, you had to get something and dig that stuff out. I mean, it was packed in there, OK, because all that pressure. OK, is this a bad design? No, this would be a great design if it was used properly. If they filtered after every time this here OK, is going to flush more debris out in the shortest amount of time than any other fryer out there. 
The problem is if it's not used properly and that is allowed to build up, what's going to happen is, is we're going to get that debris build up in here and it's going to have a clog. All right. And that pump is not going to be able to overcome that. What it's going to do is deadhead and then the pump's just going to go ahead and trip on the overload. Okay. And that's where you come in. All right, and plus two, you know, all that oil is going to drain down into the pan for that to happen. So by the time you get out there, that oil is cold. It just creates a problem. And all of this, okay, all of this right here is completely preventable if we just press the right button. When it says filter yes or no, just press yes. All right. But anyway, this here, I showed this because at the end of the day, this is probably what you're going to go out to clean out if they don't filter. All right, and I, I've heard before even people here, you know, refer to this as a bad design. Absolutely not, because if this is used properly, this is going to be the most effective as far as cleaning out these fryers or getting that debris out of there. It's all right where we need it in a nice little area that we can flush out very quick, okay, versus having to span across the whole bottom of that pot. All right, you know, electric fryers, it doesn't clog up nearly as much as these do because you don't have that pressure coming back and that fitting right down here. All right, this right here, I mentioned filter stats and the uh, the uh, filter um, course that we had. We actually showed a video on how to pull these filter stats. I give these to every class that I give. If man, you know, I give them to managers because they absolutely want to know if their people are doing um, the filter in the way they're supposed to because they've all heard about how much money they're going to save on oil. I have never had anybody that could not pull the filter stats using this sheet. They're very descriptive on how to do it. It's step-by-step -step instructions, and then we give you an area down here, okay, where you can go ahead and record all that information. I did say that you can have up to a six-bank fryer. I've never seen one. We do have a couple of five banks out there, um, so we only got up to five here. But anyway, that, that's all you'll need. And then we can only capture the last seven days. After that, it starts to drop off. So if you go out there and they say, hey, my fryer hasn't or my filter hasn't worked in two weeks, unfortunately, the filter stats aren't going to give you a whole lot of information. All right. Um, just I'm going to go through this pretty quick. I just want to show what comes with the fryers. Just general overview information. All of this comes in a pocket. Let me show you where that is. There is a holder right here, and we stole that idea, by the way. But anyway, there is a holder here where we have all this information, and it comes with the fryer. Some say, oh, it's never there. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I know that there's a fryer that I installed here locally in 2010, and every time I go go in there, I look, and that, I don't think that information has ever been out of the plastic bag that it's in. All right, so it just depends. I mean, it does come with the fryer, okay, and it's just there. So people can refer to this. This is all quick reference stuff. Um, shows them how that they can load the filter pan. This here would be a McDonald's because they use filter pads. We had the same version. And unfortunately, for some reason, I deleted that. We had the same version. It shows the paper. Um, but all these quick reference things are in there. And it's just basically a recap of um, the stuff that you would go over when you're doing the training. All of these, and I hadn't mentioned, we have a tech reference manual that's on um line is that right roger Did we? yeah that is online that you can download i keep all this in there um there's been discussion before about taking this stuff out i like to have it all in that one book that book is designed just to be a quick grab it and go it has a lot of just down and dirty information in it but all these are in there just make sure that they're aware of all these there's also uh, the, the YouTube. yeah oh yeah on youtube i, I didn't got to that yet we have videos you know, I mean, even somebody like me that doesn't go online a whole lot for stuff, but I'm telling you, I wear YouTube out. There is not a thing that I have a question on that I can't go to YouTube and get. Well, years ago, I mean, I, I think it's been five or six years ago now, we wanted to start using that also. So we try to put more and more stuff on YouTube. And I, like I said, Roger Coley's in the room with me here, and he does our uh, our tech writing. But last year, it was towards the end of the year, we went through the warranty thing and we did a lot of videos. We, we did fall short on a couple that we didn't get done before the holidays, but we tried because they had a little bit of slow, or a slow point in my travel. 
and uh, we try to get those, but we have a lot of videos on there. We, now, obviously, we don't have a video on, on every model that we have, not so much model, but configuration, but I always try to get the ones that are a little bit more difficult. If you get a two bank split pot fryer, they're going to be a little bit harder to work on than, than a bigger fryer because you got more room. Same amount of stuff for the most part, but more room. You only got one filter system. But anyway, we have a lot of stuff on YouTube. Real quick here, because this is probably the best time, and this we get issues with all the time, and it's so simple. You All the fryers that we have, the filter quicks, and I know that there's exceptions to that, but the ones that the big, um, our big customers have, the chains, all right, they come plumbed for bulk oil, okay? All McDonald's come with set up for bulk oil, it, domestically anyhow. So whenever you go there, you have to tell the controller whether it is bulk oil or it's not bulk oil, okay? And if you don't, whenever they go to dispose of the oil, okay, meaning that they're gonna get rid of the oil, they can do one of two things. Either put a cart under here, okay? And we get into this a little bit more in the filter portion of this, and we're gonna talk about this a lot more when we get to the ATO system. But they either put a cart under there if they don't have the bulk oil or RTI tanks or whatever, frontline or whoever it is, or we're gonna use our pump we're going to dump the oil into the pan. We're going to run it through the filter paper because it is going through the pump. And then we pump it back to a tank. If we don't have the fryer set up properly, whether it's bulk or not bulk, okay, then it, it's not going to work because you're going to put a pan under here to catch it or a cart or whatever to catch that oil. But if it doesn't sense the filter pan, okay, it's not going to drain the oil. Okay, if it's set up for bulk and it's not. Just make sure that when you leave, even if they have the tanks in the store, if they were not out there, to, you know, let's just say RTI, if RTI was not out there, okay, to hook that equipment up, when you left, it was not bulk and leave it accordingly, okay? Even if they say, well, oh, they're going to be in next week or whatever. Well, when they come in next week, they can swap it over to bulk. And, and actually, they're very good about doing that. They, they know how to um, set up the fryers to do that. Anytime you do a setup thing too, this goes back to before, if you're doing a setup or changing anything on the controllers, always do a master reset. Since they communicate, if you're doing it on one, that goes ahead and informs the other one, especially if you're using the left-hand fryer, changing things on there. All right, I'm a couple minutes over, um, but that was the last slide.